Hi, my name is Nicola Jennings. I'm director of Colnagi Foundation. Welcome to Colnagi Foundation Lates, talks with interesting people about new art exhibitions, publications and events in the UK and around the world. Welcome to Colnagi Foundation and thanks for coming to our first Lates event this evening for a conversation between two of the curators of the wonderful exhibition at the British Museum, Troy Myth and Reality, and if you haven't already seen it, I recommend that you do. I'm delighted to welcome our speakers, Dr. Alexandra Villing, archaeologist and curator of the Greek collections at the British Museum, and um, Alexandra is also the lead curator of the Troy exhibition, and also uh, Dr. Vicky Donnellan, who is a classicist and also curator of the, at the, in the same department at the BM, um, as well as project curator for the Troy exhibition. So without further ado, I hand over to Alexandra and Vicky. Um, I think the, the main um, message or you know, theme of the exhibition is that amazing fascination that the story of Troy has had with people for the past 3,000 years, and that is um, something that we explore in, in the exhibition um, through works of art um, from antiquity right up to, to the modern day. It's an amazing um, story that is, um, um, tells the, the, the tale of a great city um, it's, and, and its fall, uh, its disastrous um, fall in a 10-year-long um, war. Uh, it's a story that's full of um, um, fascinating characters, great heroes and, and gods um, fighting on both sides and, and the exhibition is trying to bring that story to life and, and those um, key themes of um, human experience um, that are inherent in, in the tale and, um, and we hope that the visitors really engage with, with that story and the meaning that it carries for us today still as it has done so for, for people in the past for so many um, hundreds and thousands of years. Yes, I think that's one of the things that comes out in the exhibition for those of you that have been, that, that it's extraordinary ha the enduring fascination of the story. Um, and you know, I think you'll be talking about that quite a lot in the course of the conversation tonight, won't you? Yes, I think we, we're trying to um, um, convey that um, the, 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 the reasons or trace the reasons for why this um, story has fascinated people for, for so many um, years um, um, through some of the key objects that have engaged with, with the story and, and we'll be showing a, a few in, in the course of the evening. So what, what, is, what is the first thing, that perhaps to tell those people that haven't been, what, the, what is the first thing that visitors see when they, when they go into the exhibition? Uh, uh, let the me down, move oh, the, the down. down arrow. Yeah, okay, there it. we go. So this is the object that we um, start with, uh, the, first, the first object placed in an introductory room. And we chose this because, uh, as Alexandra says, the exhibition, the, the story of Troy, really engages with some of the, the fundamental themes of human existence, human experience. So here what you see is um, Achilles, the, the greatest Greek hero, in combat with Penthesilea, who's the Amazon queen, queen of the, the race of, of mythical female warriors, the Amazons, who, and she's fighting on the Trojan side. So it's part of the story of Troy. And his, uh, his spear is uh, piercing her through the neck. It's the very moment of her death. But the story tells that at this moment, their eyes meet and he falls in love with her, just that moment too late. So you can't get much more fundamental than that, love and death in, the, in a single image. <laughs> and not only, not any image, but one of the great masterpieces of, of ancient Greek vase painting by the, the painter Exekias, painted around 530 BC. And in the, we place this in a room which has, um, it, it sort of, conveys the, the sweep, uh, the range of works of art that the, the exhibition includes. Uh, so it also is paired with this uh, 1962 work by Cy Twombly, uh, which engages with the idea of the rage of Achilles. So we're sort of, again, we're, we're linking to the, these strong emotions that the story evokes and, uh, and wrestles with. The first line of the Iliad, um, Homer's great, most famous telling of the story, uh, the, first, the w first word of that poem is rage, rage, goddess, sing the rage of um, Peleus' son Achilles. And this image is, is 
encapsulating that rage. The, the vent, it's, in, it's entitled Vengeance of Achilles. It's uh, this hero's uh, passionate desire to avenge himself on Hector, the, the Trojan prince who's killed his, his friend and lover in the story. It's the letter A, it's also a bloodied spear, and the, the way it's scrawled really brings that emotion into, into the introductory room of the exhibition. And it's huge. And it, it's three metres high. It's, it's yeah, really it's huge. an imposing it's really stunning, isn't it? canvas, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so these, these are the first works you see, but you, they're also juxtaposed with uh, some large-scale sculptures, uh, again, um, re relatively modern works made in the 1990s by Anthony Caro. And these are designed to bring the sense of um, really as Troy as an archetypal war, a war that speaks to the experiences of all wars. Uh, Caro is engaging with Troy as a, as a battlefield. Uh, this is a three, it's three sculptures from a series originally of 40. And he's also engaging with Troy as a place. It's not only the characters. These three works are, uh, represent the death of Hector on the, the sort of fallen, tumbled sculpture on the, the, this side nearest me the King Priam of Troy in the centre, and then the Skian Gate, which is one of the main gates of, of the city of Troy, as described by Homer, which uh, Heinrich Schliemann thought he'd found uh, in his excavations in the, in 18, in the 1870s. And so Caro is responding to the archaeology as well as the story, and that sort of, for us, you know, the myth and the reality, the place of the imagination and a place of, of reality. And we find the other works that are in that first space are two um, small uh, ancient Greek pots found at Troy, Bronze Age pots found at Troy, again bringing the reality of, of the, the place into the room. And also, um, these also carry a sort of another message, which is that uh, this one and its pair were, were found in Troy, but they were then given to the Berlin Museums. And in the Berlin Museums, they were in the bombing of Berlin in the, the Second World War. And that's actually what's given this pot its blackened and damaged experience, um, appearance. So it's, again, that sense of the cycle of conflict um, mm. that makes the story so, so relevant. Mm. Yeah, and, and I think just as you mentioned, the sort of myth and reality aspect of, of the exhibition, which is, of course, in, 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 in the title, it's, it's easy, of course, to, to see in these objects from Troy, the reality of the archaeology, um, whereas the myth is, of course, the tale, heroes, gods, and, and one might think that um, what the, and that's, this is something that the exhibition is doing, it, it is, of course, trying to, to also um, bring out what we today know about the possible historical truth behind these tales. But we're also trying to turn that notion of myth and reality on its head, um, because the, the archaeology of, of Troy is, is, uh, is a very difficult um, um, history to, to understand. And, and um, Schliemann's discovery of, of Troy, and um, there are many stories around it, and he was a colorful character. Not everything is entirely trustworthy. This is all, he has almost become a mythical character in, in, in his own right, um, whereas the, the story um, of, of, of Troy, the, the myth, has had a very um, a real um, relevance to people across the ages. They, it has been used to express contemporary concerns. Um, a war is ever present, and, and so this is that, that tale of, of this great um, war has, has been used by, um, by people to, to reflect upon their own experiences. And, and this, in, in many ways, this sort of human truth in, in the story may be more real um, than perhaps the, the archaeological yeah, uh, finds. Yeah, so so it, it's, um, it's sort of quite counterintuitive, yeah, counterintuitive yeah. isn't it? So let's go on to the, the, the actual story, which is, which is really the next part of the exhibition, isn't it? You were going to speak about what happens in the next rooms, I think. That, that's right, I, yes. Um, I think first, though, um, the, the exhibition, um, just to, to give you a sense of its structure, um, so the, the introductory space begins uh, with the objects I've described, then it carries through the uh, visitors through the, the myth, the story, as you say, before looking at the archaeology and then the, the um, sort of ongoing retellings and reinterpretations. 
And we start with introducing the storytellers before we move into the story itself. And I think Alexandra will probably <laughs> like to talk about this because I think it's, it's well, she always says it's her favourite thing is, in the exhibition. Absolutely. So I'll pass back to Alexandra. We are absolutely that. thrilled to have the object in the exhibition. Now, it may not look like much. It's just a small clay pot and it's been put together from, from fragments. But it's, a, it's, historically speaking, a really important um, object. Um, it's one of the earliest um, preserved examples of ancient Greek writing on, on this pot and, and you can maybe you can just about see it scratched into the pot here. There's actually three lines of, of writing um, and um, it's, it's uh, um, three lines of verse actually um, and that um, have um, translated the meaning I am the cup of Nestor good to drink from whoever drinks from this cup immediately desire of fair garlanded Aphrodite will strike him um, and um, it's it's written in verse just as the Homeric poems would have been written in in, um, in verse in, in this period the late 8th century BC is exactly the time when when um, the Homeric poems would have um, taken the the shape that, that we know them by um, today when poetry was immensely important in, in the ancient uh, Greek world. It was one of the things that bound people together. Um, you must imagine Greeks um, being scattered around the Mediterranean in, in, in this time as it was a time of great you know, discovery and, and exploration and, and um, trade um, for, the, for the Greeks as, as they were setting off in, in boats and going off to Italy and, and, and other places and Egypt and so on. And, and the, the shared culture, the belief in, 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 their, um, in the Greek gods, but, but also the, this um, storytelling myths that they shared, like the, the story of the Trojan War, War, were immensely important and especially stories like that of Troy in, in which heroes from all over the Greek world participated in and it was everyone had a share in that. Each um, city's hero um, played, played a role um, in this and, and so at the banquets where, where the Greeks were gathering both in Greece and abroad these stories would have been told and sung by bards like Homer him, himself um, would have um, been one, one of these um, persons reciting uh, the, the story to, to um, the gathered audiences there. And, and this little pot actually was probably made in, in the very homeland of, of Homo, or certainly the place where, where these poems um, took, took their shape in what is now modern um, Turkey, um, the sort of um, area around Izmir on the west coast of, of Turkey. Um, so the pot would have been made there, but it was found um, in Italy, in Ischia. Um, it would have been carried there by, by Greek traders um, in engaging in uh, yeah, um, contact um, um, with, with, um, with other cultures of, around um, the Mediterranean. And, and the fact that, that we have um, poetry written on, on, on this um, little pot shows um, th that um, it, it was not just um, yeah, yeah, in, in the um, aristocratic um, circles um, that, that people were um, interested in, 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 in poetry and in these stories, but also in, in, in the community of traders. Um. I think the whole, the whole storytelling thing to me is <coughs> really the most, the most wonderful thing about the exhibition. Um, you know, as you were saying, it's, it's the, story, the story of Troy which has been so important for our culture ever since. Um, you know, in the period that I study, which is sort of the early Renaissance, and, and I love the, the thing I love most about the exhibition was that the way that that first big room really concentrates on the story and on how you tell the story and how you engage people with the story. And the objects become, like that one, things which speak for the story rather than art historical objects or sort of objects in a museum. And I was commenting to Alexandra and Vicky before that Probably I've seen a lot of those objects when I've walked around the British Museum before, but I've never really thought about them. They just, okay, there's Greek figure vases. Wow, those are really impressive, and I've walked on. But, but actually, when you have captions, like, um, I mean, I, I took a few photographs of the captions because I was so, so impressed. Um, captions like, um, like this one, which says, uh, so it was underneath one of these Greek figure vases, and it says, Aphrodite introduces Helen to Paris. Did Paris abduct Helen, or did she fall in love and, and follow him willingly? And the captions are like that. They're captions which draw you into the story. And underneath, you've got 
this is a Greek figure vase that was produced in 700 BC or whatever it is. But the main thing is to, to draw you into the story as a viewer, and I think that's brilliant. And I, think, I wish more exhibitions would do that, <laughs> because uh, here it's particularly um, apposite because it's all about a storyteller and mm. about a story. But, but actually, I think it's something that more we could use as curators more often, this, this storytelling approach to bring in new audiences, which is what mm, we're really mm, interested mm. in at Kulnagi Foundation. So I just wanted to, yeah, yeah, to, to yeah. really congratulate you for that. Anyway. So, yeah. so picking up on that sense of the storytelling, this is the room that, that um, Nicola is talking about. And we tried to underline the, the the, the approach, the storytelling approach in this space in lots of different ways in the design. So we have a, a huge graphic that runs along one wall which uh, magnifies sort of episodes from the story, sort of chapters if you like. Um, it's divided into sort of four chapters. You see the, the chapter headings hanging from the ceiling um, in these large scale letters. So that was a very deliberate design, design feature to mark the, the stages of the story. And I think what um, it's probably uh, helpful if uh, I do now is just very quickly tell that story because I'm sure many of you will know it very well, but not necessarily everybody, and, and highlight some of the objects that we use in exactly the way Nicola spoke about. So it all starts with um, a wedding. And it's the wedding between uh, a mortal man, Peleus, and a, a sea goddess, Thetis. And all the gods and goddesses are invited to this wedding, except one who is left off the invitation list. And this is um, Discord, or Eris, uh, the goddess of Discord. Um, you see her painted here on the, the interior of a, a, a cup, a black-figured cup, with her rather wonderful winged boots and her wings flying through the air. Now, you understand why people might not invite Discord to a wedding, but it's a, it's a mistake because she finds out she's been left out, and she throws the famous golden apple, the apple inscribed with the words, for the most beautiful, in and amongst the assembled guests. Three of the goddesses quarrel over it. They all think they're the most beautiful. And the Trojan prince Paris is chosen as the, the, the arbiter, the judge of, the, of um, this quarrel. Um, you see him on the, the um, water jar uh, on the slide. He's sitting uh, on a rock playing the lyre as a, a shepherd. Um, and the three goddesses come before him. You have Hera uh, carrying a scepter at the front. Um, Athena in the centre with her spear and Aphrodite wrapped up like a bride at the back and they all try to bribe him so Hera offers power over a wide empire Europe and Asia Athena offers success in war and it's Aphrodite of course who offers him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world Helen and that's what he picks but Helen is already married she's married to Greek king Menelaus so uh, Paris turns up at Menelaus's palace in Sparta uh, on a sort of state visit and leaves with Menelaus's wife. This is just as bad a thing to do as it would be now. I often say, well, imagine if someone turned up to see um, the Queen and went off with Prince Philip. Why would he want to? <laughs> so here you have two very different um, images of that moment when Helen leaves with Paris. Um, here on... Uh, this uh, Etruscan cinerary urn, Paris sits looking almost bored at the side. This is his ship here, the prow of his ship. And Helen is being led on board by two servants, much in the same way as this servant is carrying a vase. It's like she's a sort of possession. It looks like a kind of cold-hearted abduction, you know, not, not a love affair at all. Other images show it much more as a love affair. And this question of her responsibility, exactly as you mentioned on the label that you read out, is, is just comes across so many of the, the works. On this other image, which is a wonderful fresco from Pompeii, um, Roman period fresco, Helen is stepping onto the gangplank of Paris's ship, shown down at the bottom, uh, being supported by a servant, but she looks like she's going willingly. She look, but her eyes are really um, enigmatic. The question, you know, she looks hesitant. She looks as though uh, she's not sure whether she's doing the, the right thing. And of course, um, there are dire consequences because Menelaus and his brother Agamemnon, who's king of a, an even greater city, gather a huge force. Uh, the, the thousand ships that sail off across the, the Aegean Sea to Troy on the, the coast of Turkey to get Helen back. But they find Troy well fortified, they get embroiled in this, this protracted siege that ends up going on uh, for 10 years. 
Now, Homer's Iliad, which um, is, as we've said, the, the most famous uh, narrative of the, the Trojan War itself, only tells a little bit of the story. It focuses on um, 50 days in the 10th year of the war, um, and it tells of an episode in which um, the great hero Achilles, one of the greatest fighter on the Greek side, initially falls out with his king, his leader, Agamemnon, over the fact that a, a, pri mm -hmm. a woman, Briseis, shown here, uh, who's been given to Achilles as a prize, has been um, taken away by, by Agamemnon and his honour has been, uh, what's the word? He's been dishonoured. Um, but then, he, he, so he withdraws from the fighting. He only re-enters battle um, when his lover and comrade Patroclus is uh, killed by the Trojan prince Hector. And then Achilles goes back into battle enraged, as I described when we were talking about the Twombly before, and he kills Hector in single combat. He's then, his revenge still isn't satisfied, his need for revenge still isn't satisfied. He famously drags uh, the body of Hector behind his chariot, as shown on this, this Roman sarcophagus in the exhibition, uh, going beyond all the sort of norms of, of Greek combat. That's not what the done thing at all. Um, it's, uh, he's behaving like a monster, really. And then finally, King Priam, at the end of the Iliad, comes to the Greek camp late at night, uh, secretly, and begs Achilles, man to man, uh, the, the father begging the man who's killed his son to return the body. And this, there's this amazing emotional encounter at the end of the Iliad, which sort of restores Achilles' humanity and um, brings a sense of, sort of order back into the poem and the funeral of Hector takes place. This cup is a fascinating... This is, this is my favourite work in the exhibition, I have to say. It was the thing I was most excited about coming out of its crate and, and going onto display. It's from the National Museum of Denmark's collection. So it's Roman um, craftsmanship, but it uh, was found in a chieftain's grave in Denmark, probably a, a diplomatic gift from uh, the governor of a, of a Roman province. And it just has this beautiful depiction of this moment when the, the two men meet. Achilles is killed soon after, um, but the war still isn't won. So the, the, this is where you come to the famous trick of the Trojan horse. And we bring the horse into the exhibition space, both through this uh, uh, structure as part of the design, but also through works of art, like this uh, depiction on a, a Roman sarcophagus lid. Rather nicely here, the horse is itself wearing a, a shield and helmet, as though sort of hinting of the people oh hiding well. inside. A bit of a giveaway, really. Um, so Troy falls, and the population are either the men are killed, the, the women and children are enslaved, and the city burns to the ground. Only Aeneas escapes. He's uh, a member of the, the royal family with a small band of, of refugees. He's told to flee the city um, and save himself, save the city, found a new city. And he goes on to, to found Rome, which is incredibly important for the later reception of this story. And then the Greek heroes um, travel home. But they've done such awful things uh, during the sack of Troy that they don't get home easily. They um, have to... Well, Odysseus is the most famous story of Homer's Odyssey. He meets with all sorts of monsters and um, seductresses and it takes him 10 years to get back when he eventually does um, and is reunited with his wife after uh, killing the men who've been uh, trying to seduce her. Um, and that's where the story comes to an end. My ga quick gallop through that part of the exhibition. Um, and then the exhibition picks up with... Uh, the question of, well, that's the story, so now what of the, the, the reality of Troy? And that's, I think, something that we'll go on to talk about. Just before Alexander talks about it, I think what's really lovely, too, about the story is it's got, it, it's such a, a nuanced story. It's not the triumph of, of one side over the other and a clear, you know, one side is right, the other side is wrong. There's sort of good and bad on both sides. And I think you pick up those points in, in your captions and things. I mean, I... I took a photograph of another one which said, or it was a wall thing, which says, Heroes, the stories of Achilles and Hector raise questions about the nature of heroism and the cost of war. And I think that's really nice because, again, it's, it's giving people um, the sorts of questions that relate to their concerns in probably every time they watch the news or you mm. know, maybe they've had you know, relatives who've gone off to, to fight in Afghanistan or whatever or Iraq. You know. So I thought that was very nice too, the way that you, you actually brought the story very much mm. to the present day in that. 
Yeah, um, and, and in the exhibition, we—I yeah. mean, this this is something we go into much in much more depth in the the, the latter part yeah. of the exhibition. But it definitely comes through. Even the, the way the ancient Greeks told this story themselves was um, nuanced. I mean, they were the winning side, of course, that, that were telling this story. But the accounts in Greek literature and um, Greek poetry. They, they imbue the Trojans with a huge amount of dignity and humanity and, and they are absolutely honest about the awful things they themselves do in their art and their, their writing and their poetry. Just so really it, the I treatment think of women mm. that both that sides absolutely, I think is not great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> She's my possession, so I want her back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the enslavement yeah. of women. The, the, yeah. 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 It, it is amazing um, how negative the portrayal of, of the Greeks is in, in, in archaic Greek art uh, especially. It, it's very much the, the, the Greek hero's uh, behavior that, that is um, shown as, as, as the, the sort of the, the, the way not to behave. Um, they, are, they are the sort of the anti-heroes, um, not, not much um, yeah. more than, than role models to, to follow. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's very surprising. Mm -hmm. Um, so, Alexandra, yeah. I was going to, sorry, I was, I was, I interrupted you, you were going to start talking about the archaeological part of the Yeah, ecology, think, yeah. the reality, exactly. Yeah, the reality. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> um, of course, something um, that the ancient um, Greeks still knew was where this story of um, the Trojan War took place. The story itself, um, continued to be um, transmitted to, to um, the modern day through the Middle Ages, uh, retold again and again um, until today. But um, after the end of antiquity, knowledge of the actual place where um, this Trojan War was meant to have taken place was lost. But for, um, for ancient Greeks and Romans, Troy was still an actual spot on, on the map, uh, a, a city um, known as either the, under the name of Troy or, or especially Ilion or Ilios, which is the other name that already Homer uses for, for the city. And, and so Troy in, in northwestern um, Turkey was a, a town that, that existed um, and it became um, quite um, a place of pilgrimage in, in, in already in the Greek period, Alexander the Great goes there and, and pays homage to this um, sort of almost sacred um, ground so famous um, through this, um, this story and the Roman emperors um, go to Troy and um, spend a lot of money in the city of Troy because for them, of course, it is also um, their own um, sort of hometown, the, the, the city where their ancestors supposedly come from. If you remember that um, they trace their, their own lineage back um, to a Trojan refugee, Aeneas, um, who, who fled um, Troy. And, and, and so at the, this um, site of, um, of Troy, we find um, monuments erected to the, the great um, Trojan heroes, such as this one, um, a statue base, um, with an inscription on it that tells us that it once bore a, a statue of uh, the great Trojan um, hero Hector um, um, defending his, his, his home um, city. But knowledge of this site then after the end of antiquity was lost because the city was abandoned around 600 um, AD and, and after that um, time it, it became forgotten about and, and um, many people actually believed it, it never existed at all. The, the, the whole story was essentially um, believed to be uh, um, just, a, just a myth um, with no um, reality to it at all. And um, some people um, famously um, Heinrich Schliemann were not at all convinced um, that this was all just a myth but were fervent believers in some reality behind the, the story and there's a famous um, episode told by Schliemann himself in his autobiography uh, um, uh, uh, has a child age seven he was given a children's history book to read by his father and he saw an illustration there of Aeneas fleeing the burning city of Troy and he asked his father, where is this city? And his father said, oh, it's just a story. It doesn't exist at all. But Schliemann himself said, no, no, if such walls once existed, 
there must still be some traces remaining there. And so he was determined to find these traces. And of course, we now know that he succeeded in, in that um, quest. I mean, Schliemann was a self-made uh, millionaire. He had become very uh, rich in, in, in trading ventures and uh, sort of involved in gold digging in the States and uh, various other things. And so in, in his mid-30s, he was looking for a new challenge. And so finding Troy was his new challenge. And, and this is what he is most famous um, for now. Something that in the exhibition, though, we wanted to bring out is that that search for Troy already predates Schliemann. And in fact, Schliemann was not the first to even dig at Troy uh, or to identify the place. There were others that had come before him. And for example, Frank Calvert, exactly, we see on, on the left here. Um, who um, is um, at, at a site um, close to, to Troy here, shown with Schliemann, who is over here. Um, and um, Frank Halbert actually lived in, in Chanakale, a, a town not far from, from Troy, um, a member of an English family living there. And, and he was a bit of an amateur archaeologist. and. Um, he, he was aware of uh, literature having been written uh, earlier in the 19th century um, already. And where, where now, what are the, the 1890s? Eight, exactly. Yeah. It was um, Schliemann um, started excavating at Troy in 1870. Um, but actually, Calvert had already been digging at, um, at Troy some years um, earlier. Um, he owned land at, at Troy, that is, at the site known as Hisalik at the time, just as a small Turkish village. But some scholars um, had already established that this must be the site of ancient Troy. If there was such a site at all, then this town, Hisalik, uh, must be it. Or this the big settlement mound, there wasn't much um, there. Um, Calvert started excavating there, also made some interesting finds, but didn't have the funds to, to continue. He asked the British Museum for some help with funding, but unfortunately, we turned him down. Um, and so he was very um, glad when um, Schliemann um, came to uh, Turkey some years later. They met in 1868, um, and it was probably at this meeting that um, where Schliemann learned about the likely location of Troy. And from um, 1870 onwards, then Schliemann joined forces with Calvert, and they um, started large-scale excavations at, at Troy. And this is a historical photograph of um, the huge trench that Schliemann dug through the site, searching for Homeric Troy, which he believed must be at the bottom of this big settlement mound. You have to sort of imagine it a bit um, like a layer cake, um, layer upon layer of settlement built on top of each other to make this huge um, mound. Um, we now know that the, the site actually existed for some 3,500 years, so it's a lot of build-up um, during this time. And so Schliemann dug this enormous trench right down to the bottom of the settlement mound, believing that um, because already for the Greeks, the, the story of Troy was their ancient history and the dim and distant past, that this Homeric Troy um, must be right at the bottom of, in the earliest levels of, of um, this settlement. And um, we have a, a section um, here. So it's, it's in that level here, um, Troy. Troy too, quite close to the bottom, that, that Schliemann made finds that convinced him that he was indeed on, on the right track and that this was the famous Troy described by Homer, the Troy dis destroyed by, by the Greeks. And all the finds that he made there in these early layers, um, he interpreted in the light of the Homeric poems. And we must imagine him with um, Homer in one hand and the spade in, in, in the other on the site um, there, so this um, pot um, <coughs> with facial features that, that he found several examples of in these early levels. Um, he connected with the, the cult of Athena that um, Homer describes um, um, for the, the site of Troy as a, the Athena as the patron goddess of, of Troy. Uh, Homer calls Athena Glaucopis, which is a Greek term which we would today translate as bright-eyed, but which 
literally you could translate as owl eyed or owl faced and because these faces on these pots look a bit owl-like, um, Schliemann thought that these must be early images of, of um, goddess Athena at the site. He also found big drinking cups with two handles, which again reminded him of the drinking cups that the heroes um, used in, 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 in the Homeric accounts of, of Troy. So he was convinced, and he really convinced the world as well, that he had indeed found um, Troy and the, the Troy um, of the Trojan War that Homer describes. And um, he also made the, his most famous find in, in this level, uh, the um, treasure of silver, um, gold and, and bronze that he called Priam's treasure, again linking everything back to the characters in, in the Iliad. And um, he found um, precious gold jewels in this silver um, jug, which we have in, in the exhibition as well, and he called these jewels Helen's jewels. Um, and and th those are now in, in the Pushkin Museum? They are in, in the Moscow. Pushkin Museum, yes. exactly. But they wouldn't lend them to you? We didn't ask for them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yes. we, we, ha we, we borrowed nearly 100 objects um, from Berlin museums, yes. which, which, which have the, the, the vast majority of, of the finds and, and with those objects we were able we are able to show in the exhibition the whole yes. archaeological history of, um, of Troy and, and so on, on one side of, of the room we have um, Schliemann's Troy um, it's sort of on the lower level of the, um, the, the site um, um, where he identified what he thought was um, the, the Troy of, um, of the Trojan War. And on the other side of the room, we've juxtaposed that with the, the modern view of Troy. We, we know that there are nine major settlement levels of the site, and, and now we also know this layer that um, Schliemann um, connected with, with the Trojan War, we today call Troy II, um, and we today date it to the middle of the third millennium BC. So very early period, and even though we believe Schliemann in having found actually Troy, the site of Troy, he did not find in this level the Troy of the Trojan War. In this period, it's impossible to imagine anything like the Trojan War to have happened. Um, this period is too early. It is it? too early. Yes, it's this is two and a half thousand. BC. Two and a half thousand Homer BC. Was Homer was writing around 800 uh, BC or so. Yeah. But the period in which the Trojan War, something like the Trojan War, could have happened, really the only feasible background for something like the Trojan War, is in that level, I'm um, Troy 6 7, around um, 1500 to 1200. BC, so some centuries before Homer, but not a thousand, yeah. Yeah, two thousand years um, yeah. before um, Homer. And the reason why we think that this is a more plausible um, background is, well, first of all, in this early level, the um, the the site of uh, the sites of Mycenae and and the yeah. other um, great cities of. Uh, the Greek world that uh, Homer talks about, there wasn't much happening yet. So it's hard to imagine them sending out mm -hmm. a thousand ships and engage in a, in a big um, war with, with, um, with Troy. Also, it's only in this later level that we actually have evidence for contact between um, Troy and the Greek world, um, which um, we can tell by because we find imports from Greece, um, from the Greek world in, in, in this level of, of Troy, like this um, the perfume pot or this very cute um, um, little figure of a, of a pig there. And they were actually made in Mycenae, so the, the home of King Agamemnon as told by, by Homer. And where you have contact, you can also have conflict. And so in this setup, we could imagine that someone coming from the great city of, of, of Mycenae could have walked off 
um, and, and some, someone coming from Troy to, to Mycenae could have walked off with the Mycenaean king's um, wife. Um, and um, there was definitely um, trade uh, yeah. in, in this period and perhaps disputes uh, as, as well. And the Mycenaeans in this period were a warlike people. Um, chariots represented lists of chariots and armor um, listed on in, in, in these early clay tablets with early writing on. So a war in this period is, is a possibility and, and the city of, of Troy in this period also was a well fortified city with great walls which again would sort of fit in with the way Homer talks about um, well fortified um, Troy it, and it was also um, significantly larger by this period than in, in the earlier times when, when Schliemann was still thinking um, he could um, set the, um, the Trojan War. So there is in this period around 1300-1200 BC also a possible historical setup where a, a conflict between the Greeks and the Trojans could have happened. Whether it did happen, we cannot prove. And that is, that is something that um, archaeologists are still debating about. There are some tantalizing hints um, about alliances um, between the, the Trojans and the Hittites in the Anatolian um, hinterland. Um, possibly engaging in conflicts with the Egyptians, who again were allied with the Greeks in this period. So the, the city of Troy, the, the Greek cities at the time, could have been involved in, in larger conflicts as well, involving the major empires of, of the period. And most intriguingly, there is a, a hittite cuneiform treaty, which we have a fragment in, in the exhibition, um, that, that records a treaty between the city of Troy, which was then called Willusa, um, and the Hittites, and it names as the ruler of Willusa or Troy, someone called Alexandu, and that is the Greek name Alexander. So is that Alexander of Troy? The person we know um, more commonly as Paris, but Alexander is the other name, uh, already Homer uh, mentions uh, for, for Paris. So is this the person who was responsible for yeah. the whole war, who, carri who carried yeah. off on yeah. Calais? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> well, perhaps this is something we can come back to in the questions and discussion afterwards, because I think, you know, does it really matter whether it happened or not? Mm. You know, are the greater yes. truths, you know, <laughs> truths which just, you know, as you were saying at the beginning, just are the story of, of you know, of all of us, of human beings, of, of the kind of love and war and hate and death and, you know, all the enduring themes. It's a bit like the Bible, mm -hmm. isn't it? You know, I mean, people are now trying to look at the history of, of the Bible, did things really happen? But in some ways, it's the story that's more important. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, that, that is something that we then mm -hmm. yeah. explore in, in, in the third section of the exhibition a bit more. So yeah, so as um, Alexandra says, that's exactly what we go on to to engage with in the, the final section of the exhibition. This question of the sort of human truths and themes, and the in the later retellings and, and reinterpretations, and we organised the vast quantity of material that we could have included <laughs> in this section. I mean, we had an there's an awful lot to choose from. We picked a way through it which focuses on characters and and themes. So we look at the characters of Odysseus and Aeneas first, and how uh, how they uh, encapsulate the theme of journeys. And then we look at Achilles and Hector, and that question of what does it mean to be a hero that you, you, you referred to previously. And then finally, the, the women of Troy. So that's the way we sort of navigate this material. So to take um, Achilles as an example, uh, we show works ranging from, um, this is a, the Rubens' Wrath of Achilles, a design for a, a tapestry as part of a series on the, the life of Achilles, which Rubens made. Uh, this uh, is borrowed from the, the Courtauld. Um, and this is a time when Achilles was uh, being, you know, he'd become a kind of fitting 
uh, character for you to model yourself upon, for elites to want to hang on, hang on their walls, to, uh, to engage with as a, someone to emulate. This was not universally true. His, uh, his uh, popularity, in a way, waxed and waned over time. In the medieval period, he'd been seen as a sort of almost degenerate character because the Roman and Latin accounts were, were more uh, influential in that time. And then by the, um, the period of uh, Romanticism, which is where our, our poster boy statue, of course, is situated uh, in that time period, this neoclassical work by Filippo Albacini, showing the wounded Achilles. By this point, Achilles was sort of the archetypal perfect hero again. He appealed to the, that Romantic era through the sense of, you know, he was, his life was given over to emotion, his anger, his love for his comrade, his passionate rage. Um, and he was also uh, the perfect, ideal beauty doomed to an early death and ruin. I mean, you see him here with his heel pierced by the, the golden arrow that brought, well, the arrow that brought about his death, fired by the Trojan prince Paris, but guided by the god Apollo, and the famous story that Achilles was um, dipped in the river of the underworld when he was a baby to, to make him invulnerable by his goddess mother, Thetis. Uh, but she held him by the heel, that doesn't get dipped, and that's his, his point of vulnerability. So these questions are of heroic, what makes a hero? This sort of almost superhuman quality, but still this vulnerability, the fact that, that dying young is the sort of archetypal hero activity in a way. Um, and so uh, you see him again here uh, from the, the other side, looking through. Uh, and this is a feature of the exhibition that we tried to, to very closely link the two sides. So even though we split, in a way, the ancient story uh, through the ancient artifacts and the, the later uh, works of art, we wanted to make completely clear through the design that how totally interwoven these elements are. It's not like a sort of ancient, authentic version and then some sort of reworkings which have a, a different status. It's all part of this continuous process of, of retelling and, and engagement with this fascinating story. Um, so I think that's probably enough of a, an introduction to what that third section does. Um, I don't know uh, whether you want us to, to talk about anything in particular. Well, I, I just really <laughs> wondered if you would comment on how you think your exhibition is different to mm. previous exhibitions of this kind of material, I mean, I don't know if there have been exhibitions about, I expect there probably have been exhibitions about Troy before, but, but more generally, uh, exhibiting a classical antiquities, you know, it's somewhere like the British Museum, more exhibitions that you've seen elsewhere. I think something that, uh, where, where this exhibition is probably a bit different is that it, it focuses much, much more on, on the story and also on, on, on the, the sort of the human elements in, in the story and, and the emotions in, in, in the story. It, it, is, it is not an art historical exhibition primarily, but it is, it is about um, a narrative and, and about characters and about human experience. And, and it is that which we, we try to sort of foreground and, and, and the engagement. Um, with the story through through the ages, and and I think also the the fact that we've very deliberately um, not privileged ancient objects, which might be more natural given that we are classicists mm -hmm. um, as as mm -hmm. well, and we did not want the uh, the sort of the later works just to become an add-on to something that is primarily and fundamentally you know, ancient. But we wanted to to give um, all all periods and all interpretations a, a, a platform and 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 not um, sort of judge um, the the earlier as, as the more important or original than than the later um, and and really just to show the, the connections um, through time and I think um, I mean obviously this is something that is more more common uh, nowadays to, to, to bring ancient uh, objects in dialogue with, 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 with the later work. It's perhaps not something that the British Museum has, has done um, that often or, or in, in such a prominent um, way. Um, I don't mm. know if you want to. I think that perhaps something mm. that um, might be 
slightly surprising for the British Museum is the way that rather than we haven't focused on the archaeology to such an extent that I think some people might have expected us to. We saw the archaeology as a sort of integral part of this wider theme of the fascination of the story. It's the fascination of the story that drove the passion to discover Troy. So it's sort of part of that wider theme rather than, it's absolutely at the heart of the exhibition and it's a really important part of it, but it's not um, privileged over the, the other dimensions in a way you might have expected the British Museum to privilege it perhaps. And I think also some earlier other exhibitions have focused more on absolutely. that mm. aspect and, yeah. and we did not want to go down. There, haven't, there hasn't been an exhibition on Troy, or a major exhibition on Troy, in the UK since Schliemann's own exhibition of his finds in the 1870s, wow. which is almost amazing. I mean, when yes. people have yes. asked us, you know, journalists and so on, have asked us, you know, why now? Why have you done an exhibition about Troy? And really the question is, why on earth didn't we do it before? Or hasn't anybody else done it before? Um, it, there have been big exhibitions in Germany and elsewhere, but as um, Alexandra says, those have often focused more on the, the archaeology. Um, or there's been exhibitions, for example, the, the Louvre Lens did an exhibition on Homer um, last year, which was an excellent exhibition, but took a, quite a, a different approach because it was looking at, at Homer rather than the, the story of Troy specifically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and maybe mm. just a last question. So what did you each find um, most interesting in all the, the research <laughs> that you did? I mean, what were the, the sort of eureka moments? Or, you know? Well, I think something that, that we found especially um, intriguing as, as classicists, but something that is probably very familiar to, to people working on the Middle Ages, but it was certainly new to us, um, as was um, the, the emphasis that has been placed on, on the Trojans in the Middle Ages and the fact that actually we in London find ourselves in Troy because London is the city Troy Novant, new Troy, that has been founded by the grandson of Aeneas. Um, one of the refugees from Troy. And, and this is uh, a story that is told in, in the medieval um, chronicles in, in um, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain, for example, where Geoffrey uh, of Monmouth um, tells the story of um, someone called um, Brutus, um, Aeneas's grandson, um, who founds um, Britain and uh, including also a city on the banks of the Thames that he calls Troy Novant, um, mm -hmm. new, new Troy. And, and, and we have this uh, manuscript here at, um, of, um, of the, the, the chronicle. Um, it, it's a, a, a later um, version um, of it from the, the early um, 14th century. And, and on, on it, um, on the page where that episode is is told there's a sketch of the skyline of medieval London St Paul's uh, Westminster and, and and so on are, are visible and 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 that that prominence of, of the Trojans who also were um, sort of moral um, role models in in medieval times um, came a bit as a, surprise for us, given how prominent we now think of the Greeks as uh, you know, the, 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 the major, mm -hmm. the, the big heroes and, and the role models and that. But that really is something that came about uh, properly only um, during the time of the Enlightenment and the Romantic period. And that's when, when the, sort of the emotional mm -hmm. Greek heroes really came to, to, the, to the fore. Um, as as uh, as Vicky was was saying, uh, sort of that figure of Achilles, the ultimate hero, beauty doomed to ruin. Um, but before, in uh, for uh, for many centuries, the Trojans um, were were the, were the, the the heroes, dutiful family fathers um, like um, like Aeneas fleeing from the, the the city of Troy with his old father on his back, his young son by his, his hand, and, and Aeneas, of course, was, was enormously important for, for the Romans as, as their ancestor, but then remained so also in the Middle Ages, in, in the Renaissance, for the city of Rome and, and also for the Christian church. And, and even um, the Pope could see himself reflected in, 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 in some sense as a sort of latter-day Aeneas refounding 
the city of Troy and in and, and, and this um, new Christian spirit of piety that is already foreshadowed by the figure of, of, of Aeneas in, in the ancient um, tales and and um, and that, um, that we have later uh, many later representations of, of, of in the Renaissance and 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 afterwards of, of especially this figure group of um, Aeneas fleeing Troy um, which which many of which are based on on the rendering by Raphael in 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 the Vatican um, in the papal apartments the the fire in in the Borgo where, where Raphael included that um, group in a completely different um, scene, but clearly recognizable as, as uh, this mythical figure of, of Aeneas and uh, with, with his um, father and, and son. And it's that, um, that idea of um, um, the British identity, but also the British were not the only ones who traced their, their lineage back to these um, Trojan refugees. Really, it was a common fashion throughout medieval um, Europe. Um, all these medieval kingdoms tracing their lineage back to refugees coming from Troy. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing concept, especially nowadays thinking of latter-day refugees coming from what is modern-day Turkey to, to Europe and um, that these could be considered heroes and, and people one would want to connect uh, with um, is um, something that is... is uh, gives us some food for, for thought uh, nowadays. And it also, it, it shows just how malleable that myth of Troy is that um, we can have so many different perspectives on, on these, um, the same heroes. And nowadays, again, of course, Aeneas is no longer such a prominent um, figure. And it's more characters like Odysseus uh, who, who have become uh, much more Prominent, another famous um, person who went on a, on a big journey, um, like um, like Aeneas, but but he is perhaps a a figure who is closer to the modern mindset, mm -hmm. is this sort of yeah, sort of um, lost, lost uh, a wanderer searching, yeah. not yeah. just on a real journey, mm -hmm. but also of a journey of of, of the mind, mm -hmm. um, and and also this is another. One of my favorite objects, such as like the, the little cup we looked at before was my favorite ancient object. I think this is my favorite modern object, um, um, this collage by, by Romer Bearden um, that, that sets the, the odyssey, the, the, the journey of Odysseus in, in, in a Caribbean, um, African context, uh, taking Odysseus as a, as a sort of black African um, journey um, of, of uh, diaspora and uh, the dispersion of of, of, of black Africans um, and it, it shows also how um, very different cultural connotations can be attached to to this yes. story um, well beyond the, the, the sort of the, the, the classical tradition so for me yeah. I think um, the most uh, interesting and thought-provoking dimension of the research we've done was we work with um, two community groups to bring different voices into the interpretation for this part of the exhibition and that was a really um, sort of eye-opening experience really so um, we worked the first group was um, from we work with a charity called Waterloo Uncovered who um, they work with uh, veterans uh, to promote sort of well mental well-being through archaeology and that group, uh, we ran sort of workshops, introduced the exhibition to them, and they responded to, to chose artworks to respond to. And that, uh, just the way they, they found um, resonances with their own experiences as ex-soldiers um, in the, the story and the, the work. So, for example, this uh, painting of Odysseus facing the sirens uh, by Herbert Draper, I mean, for the painter, probably it's all about the, the dangers of female seduction with these uh, rather sexy mermaids climbing out of the water, trying to, to pull, draw Odysseus towards them. 
But the group of ex-soldiers saw his sort of tormented face and they very much interpreted this in psychological terms and, you know, the, the Odysseus is someone who's just undergone 10 years of combat and is trying to go reintegrate into civilian life and he's facing up to the demons of his own mind and the, the temptations that he faces in, in trying to deal with that and process that. Um, and so that's what they, they talk about in their interpretation for this work. And then the other group we worked with was... Um, from the charity crisis and it was people who'd been displaced by conflict um, in recent times in various ways and one of the the members of that group speaks very powerfully in an audio piece in the exhibition of the sort of resonances of the experiences of the trojan women and and helen as well uh, in her in terms of her own experiences of what happens to, to women in uh, times of, of conflict um, so that, yeah, that experience was probably for me the, the real kind of standout uh, dimension and I'm really pleased that we were able to incorporate those voices into the exhibition. I think it is quite thought provoking for, for many visitors. Yeah, I think it was a wonderful collaboration mm. and, and we really learned a lot um, with, the, with these meetings and it was the first time that um, this was done for a special exhibition, even though for, for permanent galleries there have been similar collaborations um, mm. before. And, and I hope that this is something that the museum will, will continue in, in future as mm. well. I think it's, it's very enriching. And uh, also from, from visitors, we know that this is something that, 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 that they found uh, very yeah, enriching uh, um, for the exhibition. Um, and. Um, yeah, I mean, the women, women, of course, is, is something, um, it's, it, well, the, the, the topic of the, the final uh, section of, of the, the exhibition is, is, again, an element in, in the story of, of Troy that has come to the fore um, more recently, the, the female perspective. I mean, a, a lot of the, the story of, of Troy is, of course, about war and it's about men fighting and, and the great heroes, but the women are really so crucial to, to the story. The war only starts mm -hmm. because of a woman. Um, and, and, and women um, suffer a lot in, in as a consequence um, of, of the war. But um, it's only recently that the story has begun to be told by by, by modern writers and, and other artists as well, um, from the, the female perspective. We only know it from from the perspective of the mostly male writers or or artists. And we were particularly pleased also to have these two paintings of sort of rare instances of um, images um, by by a female artist focusing on, on, on the women of, um, of Troy and she's, uh, it, even de Morgan has, has done an interesting juxtaposition of, of two key characters, a Greek, Greek Helen, almost a, a mirror image of um, Trojan Cassandra and on the face of it looking very, uh, yeah, quite, quite similar, beautiful, um, a woman, but um, we have burning Troy behind um, Cassandra, and she's of course the, the priestess um, who had predicted the war and had tried to prevent it, but she, according to the myth, was fated never to be believed. And, and Helen could be seen as the, the, the person responsible for the war, um, but also she is a victim too and, 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 and even de Morgan shows her in this peaceful setting with the, with, the, with the doves surrounding her. It's really, it's the power of love that ultimately is responsible. It's not, it's the fault of the gods of Aphrodite, the goddess who, who, have, who started it all, not so much Helen. So in many ways, they're both victims of, 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 of um, fate or, or of, of, of the story and, and this, uh, I find especially the, the character of Cassandra very um, poignant as the, the sort of the silenced woman. Um, she can speak, but she is not actually heard. And, and um, the, there's very few women in, in the story who really take matters into their own hands and, and <coughs> act. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is, again, yeah. one of our our favourite um, 
pieces in, in the exhibition, a, a rare um, example of, of a, one of these women who act, uh, Queen Clytemnestra of, um, of Mycenae, the wife of, of King Agamemnon. And, and in this painting by John Collier, we see her emerging from her house and she has just killed her husband, King Agamemnon, after he has returned for the war in revenge for his murder of their daughter Iphigenia at the very beginning of the war, uh, something that the gods had asked him to do in order to ensure fair winds for the fleet to sail to, to Troy. And Clytemnestra all this time has been sitting at home waiting, sharpening the axe and now see blood dripping from it and she has, she has done the deed. But of course she also will suffer for it as um, her son will avenge his father's death by killing her, and so that endless cycle of, of violence mm -hmm. continues in in that um, in that family. It's also an interesting um, painting because it's it's a, a rare instance of a painter who brings archaeology into the the picture. Um, he's I mean, Collier painted this um, just a few years after Schliemann had brought his finds from Troy to, to London and shown them there. And, and Collier actually shows Clytemnestra wearing the diadem that Schliemann excavated at Troy, and which he ca called uh, the jewels of, of Helen. Mm. And he also gave Clytemnestra this sort of setting of Mycenaean architecture, uh, which again, Schliemann's own work also at, at Mycenae, where he went to work after he had uh, been excavating at Troy. Um, only this um, work by Schliemann had brought the, the archaeology also of the city of Mycenae to, to light. And, 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 and Collier sort of tries to sort of historicize the, that, um, that, that character. I sort of put her in, into that Bronze Age um, context uh, in, in his painting. I'll tell you a funny story about that painting. As I was leaving the exhibition, there was a mother who I think was probably a classicist with her son who must have been <coughs> about six years old. And I heard her saying, and this is Clytemnestra. And he was looking at her and he said, Mummy, can we go now? She looks really scary. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> He's right. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> he is absolutely right. <laughs> okay. Yes. Well, yes. thank you both very much. Um, <coughs>